So uh, yeah, it's Mark Fulcher here from Axis Sports Medicine. We are running this webinar series this week to try and, I guess, uh, keep everyone up to date with what's happening uh, and with COVID-19 as it relates to physiotherapy and sports medicine, um, and I guess primary care to some extent. So um, this evening, it's my pleasure to be joined by Steve Wood, who's the managing partner of Auckland Radiology Group. Um, he's a radiologist, hence the dark room. I honestly didn't ask him to go into a dark room, but uh, there he is. Um, uh, we're going to uh, talk to Steve in a minute, but uh, just a reminder that there is a session tomorrow, uh, which I think could be maybe one of the most useful of the week, which is how to market your practice and market yourself through a time of adversity. And so that's with um, Simon Grigger uh, from Volume Marketing. Uh, and then we are looking at a couple of sessions next week. We probably won't do one uh, every night, mostly because I'm getting a little bit tired of it, uh, but mostly uh, also because um, I think there's a, a degree to which making sure we've got good information and that there's consistent information. So we've been asked to do a session about the shoulder, uh, and we're also looking to do a session about how to prescribe exercise, and uh, we're looking at getting one of the exercise databases uh, to come and, and present about how that works. So. Um, I just want to get on and introduce Steve. So thanks very much for joining us, Steve. It's a pleasure, Mark. Thanks for organising it. I think it's a great idea. Um, so look, we were talking uh, during the week about uh, some of the difficulties accessing radiology and I guess some of the variation between different practices and different sites. Um, what, what services are AIG currently offering and are you operating at all your sites? Yeah, look, thanks, Mark. Uh, it's fair to say these in these unprecedented times, um, we've all had to make very rapid decisions on what services we can um, both safely offer and also ethically offer with regard to respecting um, the level four lockdown that we're all uh, rapidly adjusting to. Um, and in doing that and making those decisions, I think what's happened is different groups have ended up uh, landing in slightly different places. Um, but the fundamental message is that we we are staying open, um, and from a from a radiology leadership point of view, there's several good reasons for that. Um, we, like many healthcare providers, have quite a large staff um, that rely on the employment they have with us, and uh, as we're all finding out uh, during these times, um, having the income that we're used to having um, is looking a little uncertain. So we, we're doing our best to stay open um, and keep our staff on. Uh, we anticipate that as the level four lockdown uh, eases, there will be uh, a lot of backlog work to catch up on and we will need a, a fully functioning workforce to do that. Um, we are anticipating the district health boards will need support with dealing with particularly uh, outpatient work. Um, and that's a service that we, we do provide uh, on, an, on an ongoing basis and will uh, look to do so as they need us and then thirdly there's a there's a revolution that you guys are all part of which is this new era of telehealth that uh, you've all basically had to learn on the fly uh, and the the differing abilities to interact with the patient um, the lack of ability to conduct a, a formal physical examination um, means that there is presumably going to be a need for for imaging as one of the support services that clinicians will rely on um, and what we want to do is, uh, while we're making uh, all of the safety things uh, for both staff and patients, the, the first and foremost thing we're focusing on, the second is making it uh, as easy as we can for both clinicians and patients who need our services during the lockdown to be able to access them. Cool. So there are a couple of things maybe to pick up on then. So you're talking about making it easy for clinicians. So how, how should we be all looking to refer patients to you? The, the systems that most clinicians have in, in place um, obviously still work during the lockdown. Uh, the real question is what the individual clinician has access to. And I think what we're seeing is a, a differing range of uh, setups outside the normal office. And so uh, we, we, can, we can take referrals essentially however they can be gotten to us um, during this time. So on our website, which is, uh, which is just arg.co.nz, there is a page there that both a patient can upload an ordinary referral form, um, which means then our bookings team can contact them, or we can receive um, emails, uh, which could include a, a scanned form attached, or even just a, a typed email with the usual information that you would supply for a referral. And in the case of a, a medical practitioner, that would be um, 
you know, their, their name and address and medical council number and the, the patient details and, and the, the indications and the exam. And I guess for physios, it would include the, um, the physiotherapy number, which just gives us the surety that we're dealing with uh, a legitimate referral. Um, and obviously we're available, the bookings team are on the available on the phone through the usual hours and each of the branches still has a, um, a receptionist there able to take calls. So essentially we're open for referrals for however the, uh, the various uh, people can get them to us, particularly from uh, their telehealth environment. Mm. Yeah, I know that that's a, a definite hassle factor for us and we've had to make some new systems around getting the referrals to you from our relatively antiquated patient management software. So that, that's good to know. Um, what, what about uh, the, the patient experience for, for what well, the experience for the patient? So um, obviously uh, the last place I want to be is in a, a medical waiting room. How, how do you make sure that it's safe for them? Yeah, so like, uh, like almost every other industry that's been allowed to stay open, we're, um, we have to put that, that safety um, aspect first and foremost. So um, for the most part, if a referral is received by us um, electronically, our team will then make contact directly with the patient. Um, and as part of that, there will be a, uh, a COVID-19 type pre-screening assessment, which um, initially started off with a fairly heavy emphasis on uh, overseas, recent overseas travel or association with somebody from overseas travel. But as we move through into a period where um, essentially the borders have been closed for a longer period of time, we're now looking at, at screening people on in terms of whether they have respiratory symptoms. So first of all, we're not kitted out like a hospital is with the full personal protective equipment that you might see um, in a COVID-19 uh, a centre dealing with, with unwell COVID-19 patients. So basically anything that's an influenza-like illness or a query pneumonia, we're asking to be deviated to the DHBs because they have the setup, uh, they have the the space, the rooms, the protective equipment, and the, the protocols to deal with that. So the patients can expect uh, to be screened on the phone and then booked uh, or advised where they can attend. And then on arrival, we, we're sort of doing the same thing again because not everybody gets screened by telephone. Um, we're, we're taking uh, great steps with physical distancing. And a bit like you guys are adapting to telehealth, we've had to adapt to physical distancing quite rapidly. And in some places, that's as simple as a as a table in front of the reception desk that um, the, the arriving patient can fill in a declaration saying who they are and that they, uh, they're not carrying any symptoms. And it increases that physical distance between, um, between the, the, the patient and the, and the receptionist who will arrive them. Um, and then that follows through right through waiting rooms, uh, change cubicles, and even the way we're booking. So uh, all around patient separation from, from each other. So uh, the, booked, the booked scans now have uh, pre-built in gaps between them with the aim of getting uh, one patient completed and exiting before the next patient arrives just to reduce that risk of crossover. Uh, waiting room chairs are all separated, magazines are gone. Um, so all of those just the low level things we can do um, to try and allow uh, as best we can the safe passage of a patient through our branches um, and also to provide the service in a timely and quick fashion. Um, Depending on the physical environment with relation to car parking, uh, some places have uh, adapted pretty quickly to asking people to wait in the car um, and we can text or, or call um, when it's time to come back in. Um, the other big thing people will notice is a restriction on uh, accompanying family members or support people. So what we're really saying is if you don't need a support person, please um, have them stay home or stay in the car. Um, obviously for people with uh, with uh, maybe disabilities or young children or any of those things that really do need a support person, well, obviously we can cope with that. Um, but it's really a lot of the stuff that patients will see when they come to us is around um, that general uh, physical distancing to maintain safety. And do, do us as referrers have a part to play in that kind of pre-vetting, do you think? Is, that, is there anything we can help you with? Yeah, well, I think certainly screening out anyone who you think is a, is a genuine risk, which is probably less so in... The, um, the physio and, and, and sports medicine space, but for a primary care referrer, a quick check that the, that the patient's not carrying any respiratory symptoms um, would be great because most of the things I guess we're talking about here could be deferred by a few days while somebody gets clear of those symptoms. Um, but it, wouldn't, it would be really problematic for us to have to, um, you know, we're trying to avoid as best we can a, a contact from an unwell uh, patient to a staff member. The healthcare workforce is, you know, quite rightly worried about that. Um, and I guess in radiology, which is a bit different to a lot of um, the clinical specialties, 
to produce the images that will um, allow the diagnosis to be made, we have to put a staff member and a patient and a machine together in the same place at the same time. We we don't have any way around that. So that's why we're going quite hard on the um, on the screening of uh, of the patients as the best way to protect our staff. Um, we do have limited uh, protective equipment, so particularly with ultrasound, um, we have masks and gloves. Uh, but for most of other the other modalities, the technologists can work quite well to stay uh, well outside the safe 15 minute, one to two meter uh, close contact zone. I mean, most of them get, can do the usual um, radiographs or MRI set up inside those uh, close contact uh, uh, descriptors. Okay, so um, I, I had some questions and we've talked a little bit earlier this week around um, choosing the imaging modality and uh, you know what whether there are any specific considerations modality by modality that we need to be aware of um, so sure. I guess probably x-ray ultrasounds and MRI scan would, would probably be the most common three yeah I mean I think we can talk about ultrasound first because um, that's uh, unique in our uh, current offerings and that it really does require a sonographer and a patient to be inside the close quarter uh, restrictions for more than 15 minutes, even though um, we've slimmed down some of our protocols um, to try and uh, reduce that contact. There's no way around the fact that a sonographer has to be with the patient and there has to be uh, physical contact with the ultrasound probe for for some time. So what we're really saying with musculoskeletal imaging is um, let's try and put ultrasound to one side wherever we can, um, given that we have um, particularly X-ray and MRI available. Um, there's also going to be an increasing need, I think, uh, for ultrasound to be available for obstetric patients and for those uh, referred for, um, for other issues such as, you know, even uh, renal stones, hematuria, abdominal pain, all of the things that, that make ultrasound a busy modality anyway. Uh, as, we, as we have to book less patients to create gaps and as we have sonographers who may uh, be off sick, um, we're really trying to preserve ultrasound um, for those things. So we, we, we would happily take referrals for, you know, uh, for tendon ruptures, but we're avoiding um, the more routine MSK ligament type scans that we see quite a lot of. So really the message is for most musculoskeletal complaints, uh, a plain radiograph is a really good place to start. And then uh, from there where it's reasonable would be to think about MRI perhaps as the next modality um, rather than ultrasound, which is what uh, some of you may be used to doing. Um, now that may mean that a, a, there needs to be a specialist consult uh, in between, but I think given the unusual times we're operating and that's probably uh, not an unreasonable thing to consider doing. Mm. So just, I, I think most of us would have had an X-ray before, but if we think about MRI, if we're talking to our patients about, you know, whether they might want to have an MRI scan at this time, how, how much contact do you have with people? So they're in the waiting room, then what happens leading through to getting them into the machine and out of the machine? So for, a, for, your, for most standard musculoskeletal imaging, there will be, uh, obviously you have to get changed and that's a safety requirement to make sure that um, no one's carrying any potentially uh, dangerous metal objects into the, into the, the magnet environment. Um, and then it's a question of being usually laying uh, supine on your back on the table and having a, what we call a coil, which is the, the device over the body part that's being scanned, fitted by the technologist. Um, for something like a knee or an ankle, that's quite a quick procedure. There's a pre, uh, pre-formed specific coil for that body part that they basically position you in and click you in place, um, provide, provide the earplugs and earmuffs, and then the technologist exits the room uh, while the scan happens. And you know we are seeing that they're getting pretty quick at doing that because uh, th they themselves want to reduce that contact. Um, some things take a little bit longer to position if there needs to be a uh, what we call a soft coil, which is more like a, a flexible foam pad that has to be positioned and, and packed in place. But really, the technologist can get a patient positioned quite quickly and um, well inside the 15-minute uh, regime for musculoskeletal up examinations. And, and most of them don't require an IV line or anything uh, that would slow that down. And then at the completion of the scan, which would be anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes, um, it's really just an unpacking of the, the setup, which has removed the coil, allowed the patient to take a moment to sit up and, and, uh, and hop off the bed. So for an MRI, there isn't really a lot of uh, patient contact uh, with the staff member, which is great to, in terms of that reducing the overall um, risk of that close contact that we're, we're, we're also worried about. 
Okay, so, so look, there are starting to be a few questions coming through. So just um, a reminder that there's definitely an opportunity to click down the bottom on the, the Q&A tab um, and pose a question. I, I kind of just was thinking that something that might be useful is to, to pose a couple of clinical scenarios. So some of you may have uh, come up with some already, um, already this week, but one that has come in is around, are you needing the stage to, to vet or triage referrals for acuity? Or what's your, what's your access like? Um, we still have, uh, we still have the capacity to to do scans as are needed, and what what we um, are relying on really is the person who's seeing the patient via telehealth to make the decision with the patient around the urgency. I think it's fair to say at the moment there's capacity in the system, um, and we're not having to limit uh, based on uh, the fact that there's not enough slots to do. It's really around just making sure with with the patient that they understand we are in level four lockdown, and that the the imaging procedure that is being discussed is a reasonable thing to get done during that time. Um, I think that's rather than us saying um, yes or no, we, we're definitely saying yes or no based on the presence or absence of, of respiratory symptoms, but in terms of clinical indication for a, a musculoskeletal type thing, we, we are happy to leave that uh, as a discussion between the, the, um, the carer and the patient. Yeah, so here's a, a fairly curly or contentious question for you. So. Um, how do you justify encouraging people to break lockdown for non-urgent musculoskeletal scans or imaging? Well, the first thing I don't think we'd want, we'd encourage anyone to break lockdown. And um, for anyone who's been watching the uh, the press conferences, the, um, the 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 chief police officer of the country has been putting out some fairly um, diplomatically worded advice on what might happen if you are deemed to be breaking lockdown. What we're really saying is that we we are available for when we're needed and. Um, as the radiologist who sits one step removed from the patient, we really have to rely on the judgment of the, uh, the GP, the physio, the specialist around that, um, that acuity. Um, and uh, when we've put all screening type cases aside, obviously, as have, most, uh, as have the government departments, because they can be safely deferred for a period of time. But you know, when we're dealing with people who are injured or, um, uh, or, or are in pain, then I think it's reasonable that uh, if following a discussion with a referrer, if imaging is needed, it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Um, I think there could be a, a worry around, for some people, around health anxiety if they're not able to access the services they need. So um, I think the government have been quite reasonable so far in saying if you need to access healthcare, you still can. And that's, um, that's kind of the line that we think we're following with regard to that. Yeah, I think it would be fair to say that most of you would be uh, actively involved working in the hospital setting as well. So um, you, you're kind of seeing things from both both sides of it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the most of the, uh, you know, a, a significant proportion of radiologists who work in Auckland do span uh, public and private jobs. So we're well aware of what, uh, what the preparations that are going on uh, in the DHBs gearing up to deal with um, the potential downside of a developing pandemic. Um, and what I think the, the private sector is doing is really, they've parked most of, the kind of routine everyday stuff, um, but we're still seeing a lot of uh, demand for for uh, ultrasound, for uh, for renal angle tenderness or um, hematuria, things that the patients are probably going to want to get seen for um, during that time. And we we're, we're still going to see injuries. We're still going to see people out uh, walking and falling off curbs or um, hurting themselves with a bit of time they've got on their hands for some uh, activities around the home. So um, the message really is that we we are ready to help if we need it. Yeah, and look, I, I think that um, it is quite hard. As a clinician, I, I find it hard to strike the right balance with that as well. So um, while something is not an emergency, does not mean that there isn't some degree of urgency with that. And um, I had another case today with a patient who looks to have had an ACL injury. And yes, that could wait. We could work on some rehabilitation. We could kind of manage that situation. However, the consequence for that is if we wait for uh, this period to finish, then at that point we establish a diagnosis with an MRI scan, um, then we would refer them to talk to a surgeon to get the ACC pre-approval process underway. They would become pre-approved and then they would be able to have surgery. And so I think if we're, we're deferring that all, there'll be a massive rush and that, that could be six months for people and in some situations that could be six months off work. So um, I do feel that um, while that is not an emergency per se, I do think there is a degree of urgency and that that's 
not an unreasonable uh, MRI request. So I, f I feel like um, your point, Steve, around each of us making our own decisions about what is sensible at this time with our patients um, is a good one. Um, so just a reminder, if anyone has any sort of clinical cases that they've experienced this week, it would be, it would be good to talk about them. Um, another question here is, um, if, if you have a COVID case that comes through your radiology practice, um, what happens and is there going to be a close down period for you? Um, we would have to take the, uh, the advice of, in, in our case, the Auckland Regional Public Health Service. Um, I have spoken to them, one of their offices earlier on in the, um, in the pre-lockdown phase and uh, they are ready and waiting to, to contact trace. So um, we may not know that a patient came through uh, who was positive if they're not declaring any symptoms. Um, and then it would be retrospective and we would just have to take the advice of the professionals on that. Obviously, the first thing that would be affected would be the staffing. Um, we've seen um, media reports from uh, other areas in New Zealand where quite large numbers of staff have had to be stood down. Um, I think fortunately we've got uh, multiple sites offering the services and um, we've taken quite extraordinary steps with rostering to try and minimise um, the movement of staff between sites. So we can't, we can't exclusively do that given the uh, the complexity of running 17 sites across the city, but we've gone uh, gone quite hard on keeping um, radiologists minimise the movement between branches. Same with staff. Um, as of this week for for X-ray and probably next week for ultrasound, we're going to try and deviate those modalities away from where we're offering MRI and CT. Um, again, just about reducing foot traffic in the event that um, were somebody to come through one of our branches that required contact tracing that there would be a reduction in, in foot traffic compared to what's normal. Um, and, with their, and again, we'd have to take their advice around um, how long a site would have to be closed, um, which would probably require you know, a, a fairly extensive um, hospital grade clean of the affected area. Okay, um, and I guess we talked a little bit about um, last night about getting injections and some of your other kind of associated services. Are they things that you're offering through this period? Yeah, we've taken a fairly um, restrictive line on uh, steroid injections. Um, I mean, as you know, some of these are done for uh, for diagnostic type purposes. Are we, you know, looking to determine which uh, which part of the shoulder, for example, is the pain generator? Others are done for for, uh, for more serious therapeutic reason. So what we're asking at this stage is that um, steroid injections are done on a case-by-case -case basis. And what we'd encourage um, prospective uh, referrals for that to do, referrals to is discuss that with us first. So um, it, we really would like that to be on a specialist to radiologist uh, sort of request. Um, and particularly around uh, two things. One would be keeping people away from an ED presentation because their pain becomes intractable because the, the EDs certainly don't want people turning up that can be dealt with elsewhere. And then the second would be that group of people who, uh, as Mark alluded, who might be facing a delay in treatment. And if a, if a steroid injection is going to tide them over until such time as they can access a more definitive treatment, um, that kind of thing would be um, would be reasonable. I mean, as an example, I had a phone call from, a, from an orthopedic surgeon uh, earlier in the week and the request was around a, a routine shoulder injection um, because the, the chap had a, had a full thickness rotator cuff tear and was really struggling with basic uh, tour living activities. Now, even in a lockdown environment, that would seem to me to be a fairly reasonable indication to get on with a steroid injection. So we are, we are doing them, but we are being mindful around um, just how sort of how open and in inverted commas that, uh, that service is. Um, and the the strong recommendation is discuss first, and then we can see if we can uh, make it work. Okay, and I guess that just that is an area where we potentially can help you guys. Um, we do have, you know, we're happy to talk on the phone about these things and have some acute slots to talk to patients as well. So um, that is something that we might be able to help with. Um, a question about the cost of X-ray and ultrasound with an ACC claim. Is that more expensive because you're spending more time with them? Is it the same? What's the? Um, we for X-ray, uh, we can take an ACT referral. All we need is a valid ACC number, um, and we have a modest co-payment for that. The ACC do provide us with a fee uh, for X-ray, but it's fair to say it's it's a rather modest fee. So um, we have we typically have a, a twenty dollar co-payment for ACC X-rays. 
um, which is uh, reduced in children and is reduced for uh, fracture follow-up type uh, arrangements. So, I mean, hopefully cost isn't a significant barrier for people in accessing, um, accessing an X-ray service. Anyone who goes on to more high-tech uh, imaging under ACC when it's referred by a specialist, there's no fee to the patient for that. So, um, although there may be a co-payment for ultrasound um, under ACC for for MRI, as an example, if they're referred by an appropriately qualified specialist, there's no co-payment to the patient, which which really reduces that cost barrier for them. Okay, um, there's a, a just a request to go through how we should be doing referrals again. So um, we don't have the pads which we normally write our referrals on, um, email including. Can Steve summarise at the end, please? So just the fact that people can email them to you um scan so uh, i don't know if anyone uses genius scan but you can take a photo of it and send it so what what are the options so the options on the, on our website there is the ability for um referrers to uh to access the email address which is booking today rg.co.nz and um referrals can come through there basically in, any, in these times any any way you can get them to us we can deal with it but what we need is obviously the full patient details and the key piece of information there, if it's available, is the NHI number because that uniquely identifies the patient. Um, for a referral that's not on a standard um, referral pad, even if it's just an email from your work address, um, we just ask that that would have a, a medical counsel or a physiotherapy um, number on it that just legitimizes the request form. Um, and we can, we can, our bookings team can act on anything uh, like that. So. Obviously, it's important to include the the body part and the modality which side it is, um, and the indication for the requested procedure. But you know, in these uncertain times, with everybody trying to operate in uh, environments they're not used to, pretty much however you can get it to us. Um, and then one around uh, cleaning of the MRI scan between patients. Yeah. So what um, what the guys are doing? We, we've um, as I alluded to earlier, we've increased the gap between patients uh, to allow the staff to clean them down. Um, for the most part, the MRI scanner is a fairly um, is a fairly plastic and rubberized surface, so that they're just going hard out with um, the disinfectant cleans between between patients, um, and that that's forming the basis of uh, of that barrier for. Uh, the risk of transmission, you know, together with our sort of our front door closed to the border screening to anyone with symptoms. So, um, yeah, we really wouldn't want someone with who's um, who's got viral symptoms getting anywhere, getting anywhere near an MRI scanner. But um, it, it's like it's like all of the things we're doing the usual cleaning we do, but we're allowing the guy uh, the team more of a more time and more chance to make sure that they can uh, they can really uh, feel safe for both themselves and the next patient and getting that done properly. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's an important point. You know, there's the, there's the safety of the patient, but there's also the safety of the workforce. So um, I think you, you, you want to be running an operation that you feel confident that you can work in there as well. Yeah, well, it's interestingly, um, yesterday and today, there's been a bit of a change in the advice around the, um, the personal protective equipment. And we, we have one of our interventional radiologists liaising very closely with the Auckland City Hospital microbiology team about that. So we, we're assessing this on a daily basis. And currently for most uh, outpatient work of asymptomatic people, there isn't actually a requirement for um, for any personal protective equipment. Um, and bearing in mind, we're operating in an environment where it's extremely hard to get. Um, that's, uh, that's proven quite uh, a challenge for some patients who are turning up expecting to see staff members in full uh, protective gear like they're seeing on the television um, in the in the hospitals dealing with the the, the unwell COVID patient. Um, what's happened in the last day or two is that the the Director General of Health has said that staff members can access equipment um, to make them feel make them feel safe, even if the evidence is there that they don't need it. Um, and the classic example is masks. So um, fortunately, uh, we're just starting to see some availability of masks. So um, patients coming in now will, particularly for ultrasound, will see. Uh, the sonographer wearing a mask um, to uh, protect the sonographer who's being exposed all day to a range of patients. Um, but for the most part, for asymptomatic patients with musculoskeletal imaging, they wouldn't expect to see staff member um, wearing uh, wearing a full range of protective equipment. And in fact, uh, most of ours are still doing that work without a mask. Um, there's some there's some ongoing comment here about um, whether 
what what is what can wait and what can't wait. So um, there's probably not anything for you to further add, but just uh, that there's clearly clearly lots of thinking amongst people out there in the community about what is what is important and what the definition of urgent and uh, and high priority is. So I think that's something that we probably all need to reflect on and just make sure that we're we're making sensible decisions um, when we're when we're helping patients decide what to do next. Um, so look, I I think that that might be uh, a good place to wrap up, unless there are any more questions um, out from uh, the participants. Um, you know, thanks for for sharing your time and and for letting us know how your uh, your practice is responding to this. You know, I think. Um, there are other practices that are responding in similar ways. So um, make sure that the, the company that you normally refer to and the people in practice you normally refer to, um, I think it would be a good idea to make sure that you know what's on offer out there. Um, but otherwise, uh, thanks for your time, Stephen. And uh, thanks for, for participating, everyone. Um, keep an eye out for tomorrow with Simon Grigger and uh, the marketing webinar. Um, and I guess what would be interesting to know with a lens to, for tomorrow is what um, what programs are you using to prescribe exercise through telehealth? So are there any uh, people that you'd like to hear from? What uh, what what uh, systems are you using and what would you like to know more about them? Um, because I think that that could be something interesting to, to show next week. So um, oh, got potentially one more question. I oh, know, um, thank you. All the info we can get at the moment is extremely healthy, uh, helpful. So look, I feel like we've maybe oversaturated everything this week, but we'll, we'll definitely be aiming to do a couple more next week. Um, it's uh, It's been fun to kind of interact with people and um, and to, to get some feedback about what everyone's up to at the moment. So uh, see you tomorrow or, or potentially next week and uh, be safe, everyone. Thanks, Mark, and good night all.